Hello, my name is Pastor Rodney, and I'm so glad that you have joined us in our lesson preview. The lesson preview is going to be on lesson number 12, the De De Deuteronomy in the New Testament. Before we start, let's ask the Lord to be with us today. Our Heavenly Father, we ask for your guidance. As we enter into this lesson, we ask, Father, Lord, that you are able to mine out the truths so that we can be able to understand your precious love and your beautiful image. Guide us, Father. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we have been looking into Deuteronomy as all throughout the Old Testament and how they were referenced back to Deuteronomy. This week, what we are going to do is look and see how the New Testament writers reference back to Deuteronomy as their source of authority. Now, one thing we have to remember as we go through this study is this. The Old Testament does not mean it's outdated. When it says it's old, it doesn't mean that it's done away with, that we all we need is just the new. You know, we live in a society where all we want is just the new thing, the new iPhone, the new computer, the new TV. But when you look at scripture, the Old Testament really, when you look at it, is very relevant today. When Jesus says it is written, do you know what he's talking about? He's actually talking about the Old Testament. When scripture says the scriptures must be fulfilled, what Jesus is really saying is the Old Testament. So. The Old Testament is not outdated. It's actually relevant for us today because in Bible times, the Old Testament was actually their Bible. So let's take out that whole idea of the old and new and just know that all of Scripture is breathed by God. Amen? All of Scripture is breathed by God. So one of the books often quoted is the book of Deuteronomy. It's what we're going through this whole Sabbath school lesson. So let's start off with Jesus. Jesus is always a good place to start. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. It's a very popular story. It's the story of Jesus being tempted out in the wilderness by Satan. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4 and we'll start reading verse 1 all the way up to verse 11. Matthew chapter 4 and it reads, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Verse 3, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written, again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on the exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Verse 11, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now, this is a story that we could take hours upon. This is Jesus being tempted by Satan himself when he was fasting in the wilderness. But there's one thing I want you guys to notice is how Jesus responds to Satan. Pay attention to this. He didn't argue back and forth. Christ did not go into a lengthy theological discord. You know, oftentimes we want to say everything that's on our mind to prove that we are on the right, that we have the right opinion, the right idea, the right view. But pay attention to how Jesus responds. And I think it's something we should know as Christians. Jesus responds 
with it, it is written, which is, like we said, the Old Testament, the Bible of their time. He responds with scripture. He responds by having the power of God through scripture. And so that's for us today. That's a lesson for us today because Hebrews 4 verse 12, it tells us, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Scripture is powerful. And when we have it in our hearts and when we meditate on it day and night, when the time comes, that scripture will protect us and keep us safe. Do you, don't you agree? I have to say amen to that. So there is power in scripture. We are weak, but he is strong. We tell that to our kids, right? We are weak, but he is strong. There's no need to lean on our own works because you know what? We're weak, but he is strong. Amen. So we have a God who can fight our battles for us. So we're looking at our lesson is all about Deuteronomy, correct? So if we're looking at Deuteronomy, pay attention to the scripture that Jesus refers back to. Each of the scriptures that he points back to that to give authority at that moment when he felt weak, all points back to, interestingly enough, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy has all the verses found that Jesus references. And interestingly enough, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. As he quotes his scriptures, they're all in the context of the Israelites who are too in the wilderness. So Jesus uses these verses to not only rebuke and to say, go away, Satan, but also to find power and comfort, knowing that the Israelites who went through the wilderness will come out of the wilderness. And Jesus, too, will do the same thing. So let's look at the first temptation. The first temptation is all about... It says in uh, Matthew, Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is quoting from Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And verse 3 found in Deuteronomy, it reads, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Now Moses, the writer of the Pentateuch, the writer of Deuteronomy, he is recounting about Israel and how the Lord provided them with manna for all those years in the wilderness. Now, can you imagine? You have to get put yourself in their shoes. You know, we go to the grocery market. We go to a nice fancy place to get food. We go to a restaurant if we're ever hungry. Fast food is all around us. We could get food just like that. And that's all on our own doing. But imagine you're out in the wilderness where food is scarce. Food is hard to come by, you know? And in this story, the Israelites had food all the time in, out in the wilderness because the Lord provided for them. And so that's our lesson for us today. You know, for 40 years, they were sustained not by their own ingenuity to forage for food. They didn't scavenge their food, but God faithfully provided for the food from above. So God was teaching them a spiritual truth that God feeds you physically and also will feed you spiritually. Christ, in the moment of his weakness, found power in quoting scripture to rebuke Satan, saying, be off, be gone, and to cast away any doubt in his heart. So now let's go into the second temptation. Second temptation, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so when we go back to Deuteronomy 6, verse 16, it reads, You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. So in Deuteronomy, Moses is pointing back to Israel's rebellion in Massa. That could be found in Exodus chapter 17, 1, verse 17. 
And you know, with every story in the Bible, the Lord continues to show His faithfulness in the covenant promise with Israel. If you are part of our Hinsdale Philam community, this Sabbath we learn of Hesed, God's loving kindness, God's faithfulness, that covenant love that He will never ever break. And you know, God is always faithful. It's so amazing when we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, because when you think about it and internalize those words, it's so true in the fact that God is always faithful from day one. From the moment we step onto this earth to the end, whenever it may be, God is always faithful. The only variable is us. We're the ones that either walk away from Him, come back to Him, go further back. We are the variable that makes it hard in our relationship with God. And so the point that I'm trying to say is that God is always faithful. Over and over again, God shows the Israelites with His loving kindness, His chesed. Yet in the moment of deep desperation, the Israelites cry out. In Exodus 17, verse 7, it reads, Is the Lord among us or not? That's very piercing words to hear from the Israelites who've gone through so much, saw exactly how the Lord provided for them, got them out of Egypt into where they are now, and yet they ask the question, is the Lord among us or not? The Lord Jesus finds strength to rebuke Satan by quoting this verse in Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. Now we turn to the third temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, once again, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This can be found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 13, and it reads, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You know, Satan is... Satan is very bold. He knows he is the Son of God. He has been waiting for this moment. And now when he's at his weakest, he asks Jesus a question that, he, that Jesus internally wants. But he knows he has an ultimate mission of sacrificing his life for all mankind. And Satan says to Jesus, the God of the universe, To bow down and worship him. Jesus, remember, not going into the theological discord, not interacting back and forth. All he says is, it is written, away from me. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So this reveals exactly what Satan wants. Satan wants to be the most high. Satan wants the supremacy. Satan wants all eyes on me. Worship me. But, when, but you know, when pride comes in and when you try to reach the ladder of perfection and, and glory and honor, it means that you are going to fall way down when you reach way up. So how does Christ respond? We said, not by debate. He simply rebukes Satan by the word of God. So in Deuteronomy, the Lord was warning his people about what would happen if they fall away and worship other gods. So what can we learn from Jesus' example? What can we learn from the story of Jesus being tempted by Satan, quoting all these verses from the book of Deuteronomy? And here it is. Pay attention. This is the God-centered truth for this day. There is power in Scripture. There is power in Scripture to have it written on our hearts. You know, oftentimes we remember Scripture, and it's in our headspace. We're in our, it's in our mind. But the best thing is to let it fall 12 inches down to our heart and convict you to live a life of holiness, to live a life set apart from the world. By beholding, we become changed. 
from glory to glory, faith to faith, day by day. And as we continue to study the Word of God, we could reflect more fully the loving character of Jesus. And we could have the power from above to resist Satan's temptation. God always gives us a way out. And God gives us the power through Scripture, through the Word of God, to comfort us when we're, when we're down and depressed, and to also give us strength when we are weak. That's the God-centered truth of that lesson, and I hope that you could understand and, and really internalize it, what that means for you personally, so that when you teach it, and when you are able to share that good God-centered truth, you could speak not only from your head, but also from your heart, and you are convicted. So our next, our next day, we are going to look into Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 and 19. Turn with me to Deuteronomy. This is a very beautiful message <clears throat> found in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 and 19. Let's read that together. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 and 19, and it reads, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. As we get to know each other more, my main thing that I love to say is, what is the God-centered truth? Take away all the, the information that we have stored in, and let's reduce it to find out what is it that God is trying to tell you in the moment of reading the Word. What is the God-centered truth found in Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 and 19? And I believe it's this. In Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, it reads, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality. Who shows no partiality. Now, what does that mean? that God shows no partiality, that he, he, gives, he does not give in to bribes. Well, this whole partiality idea is a Hebrew idiom. When you look at the original language, which is Hebrew, it's a figure of speech, literally meaning lift up faces. Now, it doesn't make any sense in English, but when you look at the context of how they say it and what they mean, it makes a lot of sense. Um, what it means is this. It refers to a legal setting where a judge or king sees the face of a person on trial and based on their status, whether they're important or insignificant, just by looking at the person, the judge or the king will render a verdict whether they are guilty or not. Now, this is something we all do as humans who live on this earth. You live on this earth, right? <laughs> so we all do this. Here's the thing. We have the tendency to judge based on appearance. You know, there's that whole idiom in the English language, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. A, a book could look very raggedy, very old, but there, it could be a beautiful book. It could be a well-meaningful book to you but you wouldn't know if you judged it by its appearance. So we're all guilty of this. We have the tendency to judge based on appearance, by how you look. And when you look at something, the first thing you will do is probably say, oh, that's a nobody. Oh, that's just a homeless person. That's just a person off to the side of the street. Oh, that's someone who is this or that. And you know, we show favoritism to those who we agree with and reject those who we disagree with. And when we do this, we ourselves become a judge with evil intentions. And that can be a very dangerous thing because we could become very arrogant and sad to say, might take the place of God in terms of judging. Judging is not what we should be doing. Judging should be left to God. 
because at the end, he has the final verdict on the person that we might be judging. So here's the beautiful thing. Here's the God-centered truth. God doesn't treat people this way. God doesn't judge based on appearance. God doesn't judge based on what you wear. God doesn't judge by the way you look. He shows no favoritism. He doesn't judge based on appearance. He is loving to everyone. He is faithful to anyone regardless of status. Salvation is given to whosoever believes in him. That's a beautiful thing. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that what? Whosoever. Who is that whosoever? That's me. That's you. That's you watching this video right now. You are the whosoever of John 3.16. And whenever you believe in him, no matter what race, no matter what creed, no matter what culture, no matter what church you're a part of, you have the opportunity to believe in him. And when you believe in him, you receive salvation. And that's the beautiful thing. He shows no partiality. He shows no favoritism. In fact, the Israelites, though it's his chosen people, his remnant people, so to speak, just like us, God wanted to use them to represent his love to all the world. And so he shows no favoritism. He loves everyone. And this is one of my favorite, verse, um, favorite quotes from Ellen White. Salvation is like the sunshine. Salvation is like the sunshine. It belongs to the whole world. Salvation is given to everyone. The sun shines on the whole world, and that's just like it is for salvation. And you know what? The New Testament authors understood this. Because when you look at the New Testament authors, Acts verse 24, this is Paul speaking. Uh, sorry, this is Luke speaking. In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Romans 2 verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. Galatians 2 verse 6, God shows personal favoritism to no man. And 1 Peter 1 verse 17, who without partiality judging judges according to each one's work. And here is a moment where you could share your own personal testimony when you teach this or when you share this with other people. Because it has changed my life dramatically, personally, on a, with my ministry. Because honestly, we as who are we as sinners to judge others? Think about that. Who gave us the power to judge and to show favoritism? No one. That's God's responsibility. That's God's work. And us as Christians, we are called to share that love, to share the love to anybody we meet, to share that love to our neighbors, to our family, to our brothers and sisters, to our sons and daughters. God wants to save all, and that means everyone. And that's a tough pill to swallow because we might, other people in other denominations, though we may think they may be of Babylon, you know, <laughs> They're still God's people. And through their life, through their life experiences, and through the things that they've gone through, it led them to understand and have that mindset, to have that view of God in this certain denomination or this certain group or community. But hey, we're all trying to find our way to understand this world around us, this world of evil and wickedness. At the end of the day, they are still God's children. And we need to share God's love to them and to whoever we meet. So Christ gives us that example. He spent time with tax collectors. No one liked them. <laughs> they, were not, they were not friendly because they played the middleman between the, the Romans and the Jews, taking money from the people. He conversed with lepers. Oh man, 
in this COVID, COVID times, when you cough, you are like a leper. Like, stay away from me, you know? But Jesus spent time with those who were the outcasts of society, those who didn't, who didn't want to spend time with. He spent time with them. He interacted with prostitutes. He interacted with people who he considered to be immoral, to, be, to not be uh, morally upright in society. He spent time with them. And it goes back to what we are learning for this lesson. God shows no partiality. God shows no favoritism. If Christ can offer salvation to everyone, we must be willing to let the truth be given to anyone. And I mean anyone we meet. That's so beautiful. And I, I pray that as you teach this or as you go through this lesson yourself, that you really get to the God-centered truth of it all. That God shows love to whoever wants to believe in Him. So next, now we're going to go to our, the next lesson, which is found on Tuesday. I want us to turn to now to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 to 14. Open up your Bibles or wherever you are reading Scripture. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 10 to 14. And it reads, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Verse 11, But this, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God, is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, these verses get a bad rep. Because Galatians chapter 3, they use this to say that the law is done away with. We don't need to keep the law anymore. But what we have said from the get-go, from the onset of our study, that the Old Testament is not outdated. The Old Testament is God-breathed. And it is scripture. It is holy scripture. So what we're seeing here is that the Old Testament, the law, the Ten Commandments, is still relevant for us today. So, by taking this position and believing that the law, the law is gone away with, you actually miss out what Paul is actually trying to say. Turn with me to verse 10. This is, this is the key to helping us understand these verses found in Galatians chapter 3. You can look at the screen and this is what it says in verse 10. For as many as are of the works. Now this is key. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. You see, Paul isn't making the issue of obeying the law. That's not the issue found in, this, in these verses that we're reading. It's not the issue of obeying and keeping the law. The issue is relying on the law for salvation. Works will not get you into heaven. We aren't saved by the works of the law. We don't get the Ten Commandments. Think of it as like a mirror. We don't look at the mirror and use the mirror to clean ourselves. The mirror is only a way to see our dirtiness, our mess, so that we are able to clean ourselves. That is what the law does. The law helps us see how dirty we are, how sinful we are, and that there is a need of a Savior. This is the, the importance of the law. It helps us see our sinfulness and need of the Savior. So he makes, it, makes a further point by going back to Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, by telling us, that it is cursed for everyone who does not continue 
in all things which are written in the books of the law to do them. And so he's trying to make a point by saying this. We are saved through the works of Jesus Christ. Not by my works, but Christ's works. Now, hear that out. We are not saved by our own works. You could, you could do so much. You could learn so much. But you have to realize your works will not save you. What saves you is a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. What Christ has done, not what we have done. Because honestly, Isaiah 64 verse 6 tells us our righteousness are filthy rags. Our righteousness, there's nothing good in us. We are sinful. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And it is through Christ's righteousness that we can ever obtain salvation. And Paul makes it, his argument clear by quoting Deuteronomy 21 verse 23. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, who was hung on the tree? Who was cursed on our behalf? Who took our sins and placed it on his shoulders when he was morally clean? He was clean. When he came in the scene, John said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John knew exactly that he was going to be the sacrificial lamb for all mankind. That no more do we not have to do all the ceremonial sanctuary things anymore. Because Jesus died on the cross so that we don't have to give our own sacrifices. We don't have to bring our lamb to church Church will not be a, 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 a clean place. It would be a very bloody area. But we don't have to do that anymore. Because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. And the curse is that by breaking the law, we are meant to pay that penalty. To pay through our life. The only currency that pays for the penalty is blood and I thank the Lord this is the gospel this is the truth Jesus died for you and for me so that we will never have to face that type of death he faced the second death the death of non-existence and if by any chance we die here on this earth we will be able to rise up again and we could say I'll see you in the resurrection morning and that's the beautiful thing. Jesus died for us. He took the curse so that we won't ever have to face the curse ever again. The wages of sin is death. But that's not the end. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift, that's the beautiful thing. The free gift of God is eternal life in who? My works. Nope, I'm not saying that. Eternal life in being a Christian all my life. Nope, it's not saying that. It's saying eternal life in who? Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that, my friends, is a great way to end our study. We didn't go through all of it. There's so much we can unpack. But I want to leave by really honing in on the idea that it is not our righteousness, but Christ and what Christ has done on the cross. Christ took our curse, took our burden to die on the cross so that no more bulls and goats say no more. They will not end the remission of sin. What ends it is Jesus. And that's what makes it so beautiful that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. And when you look at that picture, you can't help but see the pain and sorrow. And many, many movies and many shows depict him bloody and beaten and battered. But the beautifulness, beauty of this 
is not the pain. The sorrow is what he was going through internally. Even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, I feel sorrowful even unto death. But pay attention. He wasn't facing any trials in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't face any pain, any physical torture, because this, he was bearing the sins for you and for me. And that's what makes it so beautiful as we study the book, the Bible, and the Holy Scriptures. Because when we put it all together, the God-centered truth of it all will always be Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for you and for me. Man, I, the more I talk, the more, the more amazed I am that Christ is so beautiful. And I pray that as we conclude here today, that you see a beautiful picture of Jesus. A Jesus who loves you dearly and wants nothing but for you to be saved. And as you go through this lesson, always go back to Jesus. We could get heated up into, you know, the, the little minor details, but remember, it's all about Jesus and His works. So don't worry about what you can offer. Just believe in Him and give all your worries to Him, and He will do the rest. Just continue trusting in Him. Even in these times, continue trusting in Him. You're going through a hardship, continue trusting in Him. You are feeling depressed, continue trusting in Him, because when we are weak, He is strong, and He will fight the battles for you. Let's pray, and as we pray, I, I, I pray that you have learned something today, that God is a God of love, and He wants nothing but to save you. Dear Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this lesson. It's so beautiful to know that Deuteronomy is quoted so many times, and the New Testament writers use it to show the authority and to really bring out your God-centered truth, that you are God of love. And through Jesus, you are the, He is the epitome of that love. And I pray, Father, Lord, that we come to you the, the bottom of the, 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 the altar of the cross, bow down and worship and say, this is our God. This is the God we serve. We thank you so much for this time. And we thank you for those who are watching on YouTube and wherever it may be. Let this be a moment to, to trust in you and have conviction to continue believing you even in these hard times. We love you so much. Forgive us from all our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and God bless.